we are starting Sea of Monsters um, mm -hmm. for our listeners. And I at least got to the first two chapters. I don't know how you far, how far you've gotten in your reread. I read the first three chapters, but it's not that much of a difference. The third chapter is them trying to get to camp. Yeah, so it's not really quite there in the action yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all the action that happened in the second chapter anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, I kind of, I had some mom feels come up in that first <laughs> chapter. And it came up with Percy saying, um, like how his mom could sense something was off and she like kind of gets that it's a dream about something going on. And um, he's like, oh, me and my mom don't have to talk about that kind of stuff. She just knows. I can't tell you how many times William assumes I just know shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got a little triggered on Sally's behalf. I was like, no, she doesn't. She has no idea what you've been through, kid. <laughs> No, she she knows that something is wrong with him, but or like that he's worried about something, maybe. But yeah, at the yeah. part about that that I thought was interesting was how we discussed before about like what does Sally know about his there's no way that she actually knows what happens on his quest. Yeah, and yeah, that whole part like verifies that because he's like, no, I don't tell my mom anything about anything anything <laughs> about like the greek world not really we don't really talk about that stuff but she just can tell when i'm worried about it and i like like somebody a friend of mine that i made from like the percy jackson videos she said she's like chapter titles are what percy tells sally and i'm like that's, that's honestly probably what it is like yeah. like he almost dies and does all this stuff and he's like oh my teacher tried to eat me yep i exploded the bathroom Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, like Aries, I threaten Aries because he threatens me and my friend's life. Oh, he bought us cheeseburgers. <laughs> like that's the important thing about that part of the story. It was oh definitely important to Grover. I like, I laugh whenever I think about this stuff because I just remember like me and um, my mom when I was a teenager, especially. <sighs> like she, like to this day now, she'll be like what was actually happening and i'm like well i could actually give you an answer now um because she just genuinely <laughs> was just like i'm just trying to keep up or like know anything at all about what i was doing and i i would do the exact same thing that percy does with sally i would just be like oh yeah everything's great sure yeah. everything's super uh yeah. definitely the most pressing thing about my life right now is how i befriended a homeless child at school that's that's the only thing that you need to know about me. Well, and then we also have the other side is that Sally knows something's happening at camp, but she doesn't tell him. Yes, that yeah. also that bothered me of like the whole thing that that Chiron told her what was going on, but she's like, oh, I don't want you to worry. So I'm just not going to tell you and make you worry about it and ruminate on it for the next eight hours. Exactly. <laughs> like that's that's definitely what Percy needs is to not know what's going on we could talk about this later I guess because other plot things obviously happen but um our whole like thing with Harry Potter last forever <laughs> about how I complain about it all the time yeah. and that the whole idea that like the second book starts off with oh camp is fucked up mm -hmm. like and he's like this is the one place I'm supposed to be safe and yeah. he literally thinks that like i'm supposed to be safe this is literally the only place in the entire galaxy that i i'm supposed to be safe and you're telling me that something is wrong with camp like annabeth is so worried about it that she like finds a way to get there from freaking california yeah um and is like attacked by monsters the entire way <laughs> uh to but still has to get there because she's having dreams about camp being ruined this is like the one place that they're supposed to be safe and immediately in the first book Luke is poisoning the thing that makes them safe. <laughs> yeah. And it's like immediately they go like right for the throat. And it just makes me remember how weak fucking bitches the Harry Potter kids are and how weak that world is because like nothing, nothing happens at school until like the last book, like the last book, they finally have a battle at school, which 
is like seen as such a big deal and i'm like this is book two they are 13 years old well, nothing that puts all of the kids well i don't know because i guess the bascal is but that wasn't everybody in danger it's like oh mm -hmm. just this one group of kids is in danger. yeah so it was never like everybody in the school was in danger all at once yeah like the scariest stuff is like oh the dementors showed up in when we were playing like our sport and yeah. And like, but they freak the fuck out so much about the Dementor showing up one time that they like, they don't let Harry go to like Hogsmeade because he doesn't have like somebody to sign his permission slip basically. Yeah. And so like they lock things down so hard when one thing happens and it's like in this world, Luke shows up and poisons the thing that makes them all safe, thereby making them unsafe. And Chiron is getting, is has been like kicked out of his position. <laughs> like yeah. they find out about that once they get to camp in this book, but it's like immediately it's like Chiron isn't in charge anymore and he's the only person that we trust mm -hmm. camp isn't safe anymore so literally every single kid that is at camp is now in like mortal danger and we have to go and find this thing to like save them so they don't all die before we get back yeah it's like there is no there's no like comparison to something like that in Harry Potter I guess maybe in like the last battle but it's still like a big battle it's not like somebody is attacking the literal school and it, and they're just having to defend themselves like there's adults there that are helping them those kids don't they don't have anybody like dionysus is too drunk to care <laughs> and, yeah, dionysus is too drunk and chiron has limited abilities like he's a great chiron can't be there because they kicked him out of his that's true. They like kicked him out of his position. And so he's not allowed to be there because people are getting paranoid about him because Kronos is his dad. Yeah. Um. So it's like they just they don't think that he's sa a safe person to be at camp anymore. And so he can't I don't remember where he is, but he can't really be there either. And so it's like they they get like a nice place to be in for one book. And then immediately the beginning of the second one, it's like, never mind. Yep. This is all getting fucked up for you now. <laughs> it's only you're you're a seventh grader, but already your like sense of like safety is already being threatened by the guy that you thought was a friend of yours until he tried to murder you in the woods. The similarity we have between this and the second Harry Potter book is that, you know, school is too dangerous for you or your your magic place is too dangerous for you right now. Mm -hmm. But we have Percy being like, oh shit, what's going on? I want to help. And we have Harry being like, you can't keep me from magic school. That's the one place I like. Yeah. Like, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care if it's too dangerous right now, little elf child that is actually a slave. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to like go there anyway. Like, I can't, it would honestly be a dangerous activity for anyone to try to tell Percy you're not allowed to go to camp. He'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'm going to go to camp right now just to spite you and blow up something in your face. Like, that would, that would, like, <laughs> never, he, he would immediately be like, what's going on? What's wrong with camp? Who died? Yeah, like, which is why Sally leaving him on that cliffhanger before school is so bad. Yes. Tell your child what's going on oh so they don't, because people literally die. Or at least don't do that. You know, at least yeah. don't like start the morning off with, oh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And then <laughs> one thing that was, I, I, I also like how sweet it is that Percy is so worried about Grover. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like people downplay like how important Grover is for the whole Percy and about Grover trio and just how Grover is Percy's best friend. Yeah. And I feel like people forget about that because they focus so much on the romance stuff. Yeah. They just forget that, no, Grover is his best friend. Grover was friends with him before he even knew he was, like, who he was. Um, yeah. And it's, and I love, I always love that about Sea of Monsters, that the thing that worries him and makes him need to figure out what's going on is that he got scared by having a bad dream about Grover being chased by something and he's like I have to go save my friend yeah and I mean there's something so pure about them having this link as best friends mm -hmm. yeah the I think that happens in this book where they where they do the empathy link thing um mm -hmm. where Grover can like feel Percy's emotions which like <laughs> 
yes. my God, <laughs> I, I'm thinking about the thing that people always bring up with that is the Heroes of Olympus books where Percy just goes through the the fucking ringer in those books. It's ridiculous the amount of things he goes through in those books. And um, it's just like Percy gets traumatized extensively. Let's just let's fucking go. That's the only thing that happens in those books when it comes to Percy. And so it's wild to think that Grover isn't around for a lot of those books, but he's definitely feeling everything that Percy's going through. And he must just be like, what the fuck is, what the fuck is going on um, with like all the things that he would be feeling from him. But it's still there. Like it, even in like the last book that just came out last year, he still has like that whole empathy link thing. And I love that they still have that and mm -hmm. that both of them want like want it like by the time the books are coming out now are like Percy's like 18 they don't necessarily need it in the same way but they just want it because they're best friends why would you not want to be able to feel how your best friend is doing without actually having to talk to them yeah and I mean I, th I feel like I've had friendships like that in real life where it's like I just have a feeling that I need to like text them or go find them or something like that I laugh because I do that with you sometimes and it's really funny. Like oh. I remember a couple a couple weeks ago, all of a sudden I just got this feeling. I was like, I should send Mandy like a motivational happy like <laughs> reel on Instagram. And I'm like, why do I want to do this suddenly? And I just like and I sent it to you. And literally right after I sent it to you, I saw like a post you made where you were sad about something. <laughs> and I was like, I swear, I didn't see that before I sent that to you. I just for some reason was like, Mandy's probably sad today. And yeah. I was like, I don't know why I, why, I, why I did that. It just happens like that sometimes. And it would be helpful, honestly, especially I like, I think I like the empathy link a lot because if you lived in like a, if you were in like a magical world like this, where that existed and your best friend was Percy Jackson <laughs> and was like always in the middle of everything and people are constantly putting him in the middle of these horrible situations. Yeah. I would also want to have something there where I could check on him to make sure he's still alive and yeah. that he's okay. Um, so that if he's not okay, I could contact him and talk to him and ask him what's going on. Um, that just makes sense. Like if, if I was in danger, like, or if I had somebody who could be in danger, I would want to make sure that they were okay by oh having gosh. something like that. That's not like a creepy, like the creepy way, I guess, like in Harry Potter with the map. The, yeah. the martyr or oh, what is that? Map. the map or whatever the that um that james and all those people make up yeah. um because that map is kind of it's it's like a good idea but it's also creepy at the same time and could be used very badly against them and i'm pretty sure at some point it does i just remember um harry using that freaking map to just like watch Ginny walk around in circles when she was at school when they were in the tent and I'm like this is a little bit weird that you're just like spying on your ex-girlfriend because you're like lonely and don't know what else to do when you're in the middle of this war and can't talk to anybody um, but I'm just like this is kind of strange well I mean like a modern day equivalent I guess and a technological equivalent rather than magical is sharing your location with somebody because that's kind of like that's the best we can do, you know, is like look at each other's stories on social media, couple that with locations and then be like, oh, shoot, maybe I should check on this person. But mythologically, I feel like they right away tell us that this is about the Odyssey pretty quickly. Um, so in the dream where Grover is running away, they don't say that it's a Cyclops that is following him, but it's it's almost clear to me in the sense that like the way that he describes the smell that like mm -hmm. there's a smell of blood and meat and stuff and um it it does bring up that picture of the cyclops who's kind of like a shepherd and and eats odysseus's men like that um but of course the other the other hint we get is like honestly one of the most devastating monsters from the odyssey which is the lystragonians um so the chapter two is the dodgeball game, yeah, which is a creative way to do it. So the story with the Lystragonians, it's like double devastating because something devastating happened before that. Um, Aeolus, the god of winds, gave them like a special bag 
And he had tied up all of the other winds except for the one that would direct them towards Ithaca, Odysseus's home. Mm -hmm. And so all of the other winds were packaged up in this bag and, you know, it was like, release them when you get home kind of thing. And the men all of a sudden decide, oh, Odysseus is hiding something from us because for whatever reason, he doesn't tell them what it is. And they're like, there must be some sort of treasure in here from Aeolus. Let's look in the inside, which blows them back. He has to have this embarrassing conversation with Aeolus where he's like, I think you're screwed because like that happening means some God's mad at you. So like, <laughs> bye. Um, and uh, then they get to the Lystragonians. So when they get there, they have 12 ships. They leave with one. Like, um, it's that bad. So they land on the island. He sends some messengers, and they go and meet the king. And the king immediately eats one of the three men that's there. So the <laughs> other two run and scamper back. And they had all parked their ships in this cove, except for Odysseus. And the cove was surrounded by cliffs. So these giant people are then hauling rocks at their ships that are down on the cliffs. And since Odysseus wasn't parked there, he just cuts his losses and leaves. And the rest of the ships get massacred. Like they, they talk about the Lystragonians like spearing them like fish to take back home to eat. So it's like, it's really, really devastating. You think he lost 11 ships of men. And um, so the fact that that's the very first monster, like, Mm -hmm. It's pretty intense. And the fact that Tyson takes them on on his own, um, like pretty much. The one thing with Percy Jackson world that I think is really funny is that they call the Lastragonians, because it's hard to pronounce, mm -hmm. they call them Canadians. <laughs> and it's like a thing in all the books. And it re reading this reminded me there's this really funny scene in the Heroes of Olympus books, when Percy has the one when he has amnesia, mm -hmm. one of the kids that are with him is actually, actually Canadian. <laughs> Frank oh is gosh. actually Canadian. And, you know, Percy has amnesia. He doesn't really remember that much. And they run into the, them when he has amnesia. And they're, and the kids, like Hazel and Frank don't, haven't, are, they're still like babies. Like they haven't really seen a lot of monsters. So they're like, what the hell are those things? And Percy with amnesia, oh, they're Canadian. Well, they're Canadians. And actual Frank, an actual Canadian is like, excuse me. <laughs> I was just like, this is wonderful. <laughs> that he, when he has amnesia, he remembers that they're called Canadians and nothing else. He doesn't actually know what they really are. He just knows that they're called that. And I'm like, that's, thank you, Rick Riordan for that because that made me laugh remembering that scene. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they're actually his half brothers, by the way, which is uh, sometimes Rick nods towards those things. And sometimes he doesn't. He doesn't mention it here, but um, they are children of Poseidon. So that was also interesting. But I thought the dodgeball angle, like yes. taking that hurling rocks at the ships and turning that into dodgeball was a pretty cool idea. I like that, too. And I, I it was also just like a good kind of scary thing to start with like the idea of them in like gym class where he can't have his weapon with him even yeah. if he wanted to because they can't when you're in gym class you have to wear stupid clothes <laughs> when you're in gym and so he doesn't have it with him and so he's literally just like cornered and can't get away or do anything um i always love whenever annabeth like surprises people with being invisible where they're like, what the heck is, what, who's, what, who, like nothing just stabbed me. <laughs> and she's like, hi, I am here. I've been stalking you all day, but you won't like the, the part before that, that I thought was funny, which shows like Percy's Percy-ness is that when he's in the hallway and he, he hears Annabeth say his name and he's like, there's no way a girl would ever be talking to me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That made me laugh. So <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know that exact feeling of like, nobody likes me. Mm -hmm. Like nobody wants to talk to me. There's absolutely no way a girl is actually wanting to talk to me right now. So obviously I'm hallucinating and I'm just hearing things. So I'm just going to keep going on with my life. Yeah. It was so funny to read that. <laughs> 
other thing that stuck out to me was like the whole thing with Percy and Tyson. And when you think about his friendship with Grover too, yeah. Percy's not the thing like me for the underdog. He's like, yeah. I, everybody isn't noticing this person in the way they should. So I'm taking them under my wing. I love, I love Tyson so much because the whole thing on the show where they're like monsters don't always look like monsters is so like a personification of that is Tyson where he's like a cyclops or whatever, but he is like the sweetest, most precious child. Like the first time you ever hear about him is, is um Sally telling Percy to go and meet him because he's scared of going on the underground subway by himself yeah. and that he like, cries at school when people are mean to him so percy gives him like a peanut butter sandwich and to make him feel better and yeah. and just like it, i don't know like we obviously don't know like and i don't know if anyone would ask rick things like this like what he like based like tyson's kind of like innocent or like i don't know stuff on like how he acts like how sweet he is but at least for me, being an autistic person, it reminds me of autistic people sometimes of how like being afraid of going underground by yourself, being like overwhelmed by people at school, being mean to you, not knowing how to handle just like normal things and kind of needing somebody like someone else like Percy to be around to just kind of help you out and protect you when people are being mean where you just sit there and cry even though you're a cyclops and you could easily kill all of them you don't want he doesn't want to he doesn't want to hurt anybody yeah. but i don't know if that was what he was going for or not but i liked i liked it because it reminded me of a lot of autistic people especially autistic kids but really any autistic people when we're not like masking or like pretending like we're fine that's kind of what we're like on the inside where we just want to like cry because we're overwhelmed by like simple <laughs> things and so i found that i liked that like reading that this time because i definitely didn't know that i was autistic the first time i read these books and i was like oh that's very it's very sweet either way how he like frames somebody like tyson like the the i saw i found like a a free like PDF of CF monsters that I'm reading it on because I don't have any money. And so I, in that PDF version, they have like the original dialogue where the kid that's the big rich bully well, uh, calls per, uh, not Percy calls Tyson, the arsler mm -hmm. and Percy just gets so mad at him, especially for that. And it's like, he is not that he is like a good kid and get the, and like, threatens basically to like fight like stops himself from actually fighting him mm -hmm. and I was like that's really good to have in a kids ish book to have something like that out there to tell them like no don't say that word don't talk don't treat kids this way because Tyson yeah. is like a million kids that I can remember going to school with yeah he's just kind of like forgotten and um I mean, the mist makes it even more sad because the mist prevents him from being helped at all. Like we we hear that Sally's called social services, but for whatever reason, they can't see past the mist enough to even find him. Like mm -hmm. his his whole refrigerator box that he sleeps in is not there for them. And it's it's also like a thing of this like super like rich school with like really rich like kids that are seen as like you know troublesome probably like rich kids go to going to a school like this mm -hmm. just so they can graduate that they ad like adopt somebody like tyson um pure because to try to make it look like they're nice people um <laughs> it just reminds me of a lot of people i knew at school that would do things like that of acting like oh we're nice see we're helpful we're helping the community we're adopting this like homeless child but also he's relentlessly bullied the entire time he's at school and Percy doesn't, doesn't have any friends because he's nice to Tyson and they literally tell him in front of Tyson if you weren't friends with him we would be friends with you or you would have more friends Percy doesn't care because he's a nice he's a good person but mm -hmm. but like the part that like killed me was at like the end ish of when they're at school before everything happens at in gym that Tyson is like sitting there crying being like I don't know what's going to happen to me next year if you're not here because whether the school pretends like they're nice or not like 
Percy's the only reason he made it through that school year because he like basically is like his little bodyguard and if Percy's not there he's definitely not going to last and the school might not even bring him back next year (laughs) and it's just like that whole horrible thing of Jesus Christ (laughs) this is like a homeless child and the school just doesn't doesn't actually care (laughs) yeah it's like um not only do the school doesn't care about anything i i t- told you like i was getting the vibe that rick's mad at some sort of education system <laughs> yeah. because like the teachers are negligent on purpose and and mm-hmm. like every single test that they do so the english teacher saying oh we're gonna talk about lord of the flies so let's go outside and all you guys bully each other <laughs> and like um the great chemistry, idea what was it it was like the first one to make an explosion I majored in chemistry for a short while, and what made me stop was this one experiment where we had to do it under something called a fume hood, because, like, when you pour these two chemicals together, the gas that it lets off is toxic, and so you have to do the entire thing under this, like, vented area, and I remember being like, oh, this is really scary, I don't like this, Mm -hmm. and so the fact that there's just a teacher like, hey, here's a bunch of chemicals, have fun whoever makes something explode wins the like kid who's being like the bully in this in those chapters i was like i know so many kids like that (laughs) i knew of so many kids like that were that were just like that and i'm like this is bringing back not so happy memories (laughs) of school and just remembering like the rich kid who knew everybody would just get away with literally everything and it's like no one even tried to do anything because they it would never work we're like we're just dealing with this asshole yeah it's kind of like their parents would probably buy somebody off or something if they did do something and they're so mean to tyson they are so mean and it, like percy even calls it what it is and he's like they like feeling more powerful than the six foot kid mm-hmm. um, because he scares so easily and because he's so sensitive and i i love how percy never gets like frustrated with Tyson like literally ever in all of the in all of the books <laughs> there's never a point where he's like god stop crying or yeah. like can you just be like tougher or stronger or what no he never says that to Tyson and it's like reason 5000 why you can love Percy as a character but he is like a very Percy as a character is a more like soft person i guess um like he doesn't, he's not like big and tough like that. That's kind of the whole thing with him is that the world wants him to be, but he, no, um, he could never be like that. And he doesn't want to be like that. And so it makes sense why he would feel that way, but it's still so sweet to see him have Tyson as like his brother well, and literally, really like probably. fight anybody who is mean to him. Like anyone who's mean to Tyson will die. <laughs> like don't don't do it just don't do it don't he was being a brother before he even knew it's so sweet mm-hmm. and it's just so sweet how protective he is of him and how he doesn't because to go with like if you want to think that tyson is someone who has any sort of disability like one of the things that's hard when you have one like that that affects the way that you live like that is feeling like you're like a burden on other people or feeling bad for kind of like ruining people's good times or whatever, because you can't do it. My niece had her birthday party and, uh, and like the last like hour or so I was there, I was just like, I really want to go sit in a room by myself in the dark (laughs) because (laughs) this is getting to be like too long of people and noise and socializing and stuff. I mean, it wasn't even that bad, but it was still just lasting for too long for me. And then, and then my sister's boyfriend started popping balloons. Oh no! And then, like, triggered also the PTSD stuff. He he popped two balloons, and I literally just like walked out and went up to her apartment <laughs> and just sat up there for like fifteen minutes until my mom figured out where I was. And she's like, "Do you want to go home?" And I was like, "Uh huh, yeah, I I do, I yeah," <laughs> and. But it's like that kind of a thing of like, yeah, we left a little earlier than normal because I was like, I'm done with this now. And that kind of stuff just makes you feel, it, you can't help but feel bad sometimes, especially when you're the only one that is having that sort of a reaction. And it, so it's, I love seeing anything in like media like this 
that shows that like you're supposed to be like the patient and kind and empathetic person when there's someone like that like Mm -hmm. You should never be like the people that are mean to Tyson are seen as the like the villains. You're you're yeah. supposed to be nice to those people and not tell them to stop crying or yeah. anything like that. Just like try to make them feel better when they are sad or when they're scared. Like Percy just gets worried about Tyson when and is like surprised when he's not injured, but he's mm -hmm. like scared that Tyson is going to get hurt. It's not anything else but that. Like it's just reassuring to see a depiction of somebody like that, where nobody is telling him to like toughen up. Yeah, like, like a strong man or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I I think what's interesting about the dynamic here is it's very, it's very in line how siblings would react in a neglectful situation. And mm -hmm. Yeah, again, Percy doesn't know at this point. He has no idea. So it's so interesting. Yeah, she, he just is like that, I guess. I don't know. It, it makes sense in my mind because when you have shitty life experiences, you do, I don't know, you just like want to protect other kids so that you can tell are going through the same kind of thing as you, even if you yourself are still a kid. Like, want to help other kids somehow. You just yeah. want to. And it, it just makes so much sense for someone like Percy to be like, no, I will adopt this child. I am a child, but I will also adopt another child who is my age. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. I mean, Percy and Sally are one pay paycheck away from that kind, like from being homeless <laughs> themselves, because I mean, in this one, in the beginning, at least, uh, Sally is working at a candy shop. Yep. And that can't be a lot, you know, a candy <laughs> shop in New York. Are you maybe making just a tiny bit over minimum wage, depending on if you're a manager or not? I can't remember. At some point, she sells Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that makes her a bunch of money. I, I can't remember if that happens in this book or the next one. Well, I guess we'll find out. But at some point, when they do that, that is the only time that they're like more mm -hmm. secure, I guess. But they still, you know, they still never have money like that. They still live in like a smaller apartment and they are able to like get all their needs met and everything. And for some of those years, Percy isn't going to like private schools anymore. So yeah. that's like not as expensive anymore and and all that. But they're very much in the same sort of position and they just like adopt children mm -hmm. <laughs> that just like need help. Why yeah. wouldn't they do that? That's just how that's just how they are. I don't remember if they say it later, but was there a reason that Sally didn't actually take Tyson into the house? I don't know. I don't know if it's a situation like uh, we before we recorded, we were talking about like the missed stuff with Tyson. Um, and it, the thing I thought was interesting reading this again was like Percy knows about wouldn't see like the mist anymore because he knows everything now. And he was like seen through it even before he knew everything. And Sally can see through it. And so I'm like, almost like curious if she like actually saw Tyson or if she just kind of heard of him or, or like if she did see him, what she actually saw. Because it, yeah. did you get to the part where Annabeth like is around Tyson a lot and is talking to him and stuff? Is that in the second chapter? No, in the second chapter, she just says, oh, we might as well bring him. And so, Frank is like, okay. Yeah, so one thing in like the third chapter that's like a whole dynamic is that Annabeth can see that Tyson is a Cyclops mm -hmm. and she's like looking at him and like giving him bad looks and saying comments about like, why are you around him and things like that to Percy. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you being rude to him and things like and not saying things like that, like he's confused by how she's reacting to Tyson. She's like, why is she saying stuff like this to him? Or like, she says something about, he's like looking at Tyson's hands to see to see if he's hurt at all after the whole thing that happens at the school. And he's and he like is surprised, but also like relieved that he's not actually hurt. But like Annabeth is like, yeah, of course he wouldn't be hurt. And he's just, he's still like confused. He's like, what do you mean? And so it's not that like the mist is necessarily protecting him at least because she can see him and she can see like what's that he's a, a cyclops or whatever but percy 
can't and i legitimately just think it's percy avoiding it like in his mind because he just is stressed out by everything and and like doesn't and is probably it would probably freak him out not because he was a cyclops necessarily but the idea that like he was just trying to get through seventh grade without something going wrong Mm -hmm. and to be aware of the fact that there's like a, a you know technically a monster that is at school with you every day and could possibly you know bring another bad monster to you would be i think that would be too much for 13 year old percy (laughs) when he's already having nightmares about stuff and he knows that luke is out there somewhere and he's alone um but that was one part about that that i thought was interesting was him just acknowledging like i haven't seen grover since he left i haven't seen annabeth in like months that they like email back and forth sometimes but they still Mm -hmm. haven't seen each other in almost a year by that point and it would be hard to deal with all of that stuff and not be able to tell anybody about it and so i honestly think it was him just like be like if i don't look at him i don't have to actually deal with this because it feels like too much for me to handle right now (laughs) yeah because the way they describe it it was like I can't, he says, I can't tell you what color his eyes are because I can never make it past his teeth looking at him. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, yeah, the way that I first interpreted that is like the mist makes him so hard to look at that like, you know, people just don't want to look up. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess it's more of a Percy thing. Um, And I mean, I guess, I wonder if Sally is seeing some version of that at least like she knows clearly this isn't a human but she doesn't know what and i have to imagine that sally realizes that something is going on because like new york city is horrible and there are are stories of people kids being homeless and going to school and stuff Mm -hmm. but it's also hard to believe like completely believe that a 13 year old kid could be living on the street and everyone at school knows that they're living on the street and no one does anything about it because mandatory reporters are a thing and teachers are mandatory reporters do they actually do that though no (laughs) like i went through my entire schooling history being abused the fuck out of my dad and nobody reported a single fucking thing ever and it was it was trust me when i remember things that i would say or that ways that i would act i could have like there should have been like something like across my forehead like i'm being abused <laughs> like i did i wore like the same clothes all the time i would wear really baggy clothes all the time so no one could like see my body i didn't like like wearing makeup or anything like that i would not talk Like I had no friends. I would not talk to anybody when I was at school. Like people would have to work to hear me when I would talk. If I would talk, I would talk to my teachers more than anyone else. I would also, I'm sure just like say things that shows that like the relationship we had was supremely fucked up and nobody ever said anything. And my dad was constantly coming to school and yelling at people. (laughs) And so it's not like that was like a missed, like a, mystery (laughs) like everyone like I specifically remember seventh grade that I missed (coughs) so much school in seventh grade I don't even know how it's a a lot I miss a lot a lot in seventh grade I like missed at least half to like two-thirds of the school year I just wasn't there and and the days when I would go sometimes I would leave early because of the couple months when I was in therapy and stuff didn't do any of my schoolwork. I didn't even try doing it a lot of the time. And my teachers just passed me anyway, because they literally said, you're a nice kid and we feel bad. Oh my gosh. We're just going to pass you anyway, because when I was in seventh grade was when my dad was like in a battle with like the basketball coach at our middle school (laughs) and things like that. And so people knew him, they knew what he was like. And, but still, as far as I'm aware, and I feel like I would be, I would be aware at this point because I looked it up when I was older. I never got anything from like CPS or anything like that ever. Mm-hmm. And like, they absolutely should have like a hundred percent. They should have, if you see a kid acting like that, you should definitely 
do something about it instead of doing absolute <laughs> jack shit, <laughs> even if I would have gotten really mad at you. And so like the the cynical like abused survivor person of my brain is like yeah but even if they knew they still would do nothing because they they don't and so like i want to believe that a school even if in like at least pretend like they care but i also know that they they usually don't especially if it's like a rich school yeah they just don't they fall back on that whole thing of oh somebody else will do it and i don't or like, I don't want to get involved in like your personal family drama and things like that. And so I could see the school just falling back on that of being like, nah, we're just going to leave the kid like living in a refrigerator box. Yeah. Well, I mean, they don't even care enough to teach their classes. So <laughs> yeah. they definitely don't care. And what was the reason that the, the bully kid was there? He had like a chipped tooth because he like stole his dad's motorcycle or something like that. He joy rode a car and crashed it, something like that. Matt Sloan is a well-written bully because I feel like enough of us have that experience of like, how is this kid the kid with money? You know, like, <laughs> this asshole. And like, I love Rick's description of He's wearing nice clothes, but he's wearing them badly on purpose. Yes. Yeah. I just, like picture people like that in my mind of like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. The people who wear all of like the, des not even like designer, but like the popular clothing brands of the moment, but they're all like baggy, like too big sized for them. Or they like, if their shirt's supposed to be tucked in, they like don't tuck it in. So it's like, they think they're being like a, a rebel. Yeah. By like wearing the clothes wrong and it's like you just you just look like a jerk and you spent all of this money on clothes that I just remember knowing thinking about that in middle school that kids would wear back when I was in middle school was when Abercrombie and Fitch became like a thing like that was yeah. they were like a newly popular brand back then that freaking um LFO song that mentioned Abercrombie and Fitch came out then and I legitimately think that's why it became so popular um but I remember that kids, like popular kids, would be buying clothes from there all the time. And that place was a sensory nightmare. I would walk in there with my sister and last in there for like 30 seconds and leave because they always played their music so loud. Yeah. Why is it so right, loud? <laughs> Didn't they get lawsuits or something because of the perfume? I think so. I hope they got sued because they're horrible. But I just remember that their clothes, even back in like the 90s, were like super expensive where like my mom could buy like my sister like one pair of pants and like that was like one or one shirt it would be like the shittiest t-shirt and it would be like 45 dollars in like 1998. yeah Which i don't even know how much money that would be right now i don't want to think about it but it was just that sort of a thing and while you're like the kid like percy or, or grover or not grover percy or tyson or whatever where you're like trying to ground like get money together to be able to like just feed yourself <laughs> or have like enough to get by. And there are these kids walking around wearing clothes that they could sell and make way more money than you'll make in like an entire year. Yeah, and They're just like wearing it wrong and they don't care. And they don't care if they mess it up because they can just buy new clothes. I was trying to remember the things that happen in the show that will be different than the books um well i one thing that came to mind during this discussion was like talking about how annabeth right away kind of like discriminates against uh tyson i guess is the best word we can use yeah, yeah she we does have a different dynamic going on with leah being black like maybe she's not going to be as prone to being judgmental like that but then again we also saw her immediately be like oh medusa we need we need to <laughs> It's, it's, it'll be interesting, especially considering whoever they cast for Tyson. Um, like it's been, when was the last time they cast a white person? Maybe Walker? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, like Poseidon, I suppose. Um, but like, it's been a while since they have. And so it's, it's a high probability that, that Tyson won't be. And it, so that makes that whole dynamic different than it is in the books where every where they're both white but it also like just fits with like annabeth kind of 
personality because she does have a reason for why she is like that about Cyclops because she was traumatized by one <laughs> when she was younger with Luke. And so I can't imagine that would change too much, but it is like, uh, even reading like the third chapter of this, it's interesting to read her like being like, get that thing away from me. And like, why do you want to be around this thing? Well, while Percy is like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I have adopted this homeless child. What do you, why are you being mean to this child who just loves peanut butter that I've been protecting this entire year because I have to do something to protect somebody. I can't just not protect something <laughs> and for all this time when I'm trying to go to school. Um, but it is like a weird dynamic to like, read her almost like not being on board with him. And that's very much like a thing that I like that part of it. Like, I like the fact that she's wrong and that she has to be like, she has to confront like the reasons why she feels like that. Because yeah, like the, I love Ty Tyson's whole thing is that it, he is the sweetest little child. And he, even though he's a Cyclops, he would never hurt anyone ever. He's not dangerous. He's not scary. There's so many more people that are way more scarier than he is. And it, just because he's a Cyclops, it doesn't mean that there's inherently something wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And I just like them bringing this up <laughs> because that's like a, a definite theme kind of with a character like Luke in this wow. series, especially because Hermes sucks <laughs> in the second book. We haven't, we haven't gotten to that yet, but mm -hmm. he is a little gaslighting little bitch baby. And it, it makes me mad remembering what he's like because I can't, I'm not 100% sure if it's this book or another book, but at some point he literally, he says to Percy like, like, oh, you can never just stop talking to your family. How, what, when have we ever heard that before? And what he literally tell, says to Percy like, oh yeah, no matter how bad your family is, you can never just stop talking to them. And it's literally like Hermie is trying to justify telling Percy to go talk to Luke when Luke tries to fucking kill him every yeah. single time he does. And it's, and I can't remember if it's this book that he does that with or not, but either way, like when they get to camp and they see what's wrong with everything and on all that, the reason why they leave is because Hermes lets them leave. And the reason, the only reason he lets, like he does this is because he wants Percy to go and like save Luke and all that happens is that Luke tries to kill him a lot and and Annabeth and Grover and it's it's like really brutal what like how that ends at like the end of the book like it's honestly it's gonna be dep like depressing as hell it's, I'm gonna be really angry like reading that because part of that that's different obviously is that we've met Hermes already Mm -hmm. And Hermes in season one is very like, he's at least admitting very openly the things that he has done not so great. Yeah. And basically is like, I suck as a dad. And your dad told me that I suck as a dad, but we both agreed that we both suck as dads. And okay, <laughs> that's pretty much that conversation. And so we at least had him be empathetic, but in this season, it's like hard to not get fucking pissed at him I, it, it's like the whole thing with these books of it's going to be a lot harder to not get like for the audience to not get like super angry at some of these characters when we're having to like literally watch it happen instead of reading it in a book yeah it's it's easier to hear I, <laughs> i'm just thinking of like all the people like us out there who like percy jackson and have like had to go no contact with family members or are thinking about it or are kids that like hate their parents because their parents suck ass hearing like somebody like Hermes be like you just have to always talk to your family because they're your family and you just have to forgive them no matter how horrible they are and it's like no <laughs> no I reject this thank you very much <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to hear that. I don't know. I want to see how Lin-Manuel Miranda plays that. Because mm -hmm. it's going to be very good. Because, yeah, I don't know. Hermes is very, like, even after Luke is dead, he's very much like, oh, I am sad because my child did this, but I, but my child was also a hero. And it's like, 
I will vomit on your head if you like I would rather do that than actually admit or like ever believe that Luke is actually like the hero I don't care if the prophecy says that he is the hero yeah, no yeah. I don't think that he actually is the one that is I think that it's somebody else when we get to that point but it's that's one of those things with this book being turned into the show that will be interesting is that you're forced to kind of it's a lot harder to kind of let that stuff go when you're gonna have to actually watch this stuff happen especially if they change because they could always change things around in some way like it's mm -hmm. impossible to think about what they could change because it's you just don't there's so many different things that they could do yeah and i don't even try going there in my head because it just doesn't make sense <laughs> and like in my brain it doesn't make sense like before I watched like the finale, I never considered that Annabeth would be there to during like the last fight yeah. and, and throw Luke's dagger at his head <laughs> and be like, I fucking hate you, you stupid asshole. And, and all that kind of stuff. When we watched it, it made complete sense. But before that scene happened, I never would have even considered it like an option to even change anything about that scene. And so these like stories are like embedded in my head. So I just can't even try to like act like I could figure out how like I give the the writers credit for being able to figure out things that they could change <laughs> because I I would be bad at that I just like these they're set in my head in one way and I can't like deter that far from them but I'm sure that they will change things Rick Riordan has said that that he every time he gets like a script change or whatever he mentions it when he posts on social media and talks about like why he okays certain changes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there could be things that they change with that. The thing with this book that's interesting is that it's the shortest one out mm -hmm. of all the other, out of the entire series. And so it means that there's things that they could conceivably add in because they have more time to do that. Uh, I don't know what they would, but they could do that if they really wanted to. So the Hermes thing could be something, and I don't remember, I can't, I can't remember if at the end of The Lightning Thief, Percy has like the dream that he does on the show where Kronos is telling him like, you need to stay alive in order for my plan to work. Like, I think something to that. I can't remember what he says to him in that dream, but the one where he wakes up and says like, oh, I dreamt about Grandpa. Grandpa, Grandpa Kronos. I love that. <laughs> and so I can't remember if he has that dream or not in the in the first book because if he doesn't, then he if he doesn't he finds out about it sometime in this book and I guess if he doesn't we'll like see it happen later on. But that does give him a more clear perspective. Like it's kind of this scary ominous thing in the back of his mind all the time of like what does that mean? Yeah. Like why would why would the super mega villain want me to be alive? I don't want to be alive if it means that everyone's going to die. <laughs> yeah. And like that whole thing, like the last thing Percy needs is somebody telling him that him being alive is a bad thing. Like the 17th person to <laughs> ever mention him that to him just this week. Like, let's not, let's not make this any worse, grandpa, what you're doing it anyway. But like, so that brings a different, if that doesn't happen at the end of the first book, it just leaves it, as something like kind of in the back of his mind um, in between the seasons that he I'm sure is spending as much as his PTSD brain can not thinking about it but you can't help but think about something like that the main thing with the TV show that I hope they change and this is just me being like selfish is that I just want more scenes with Grover uh -huh. um, because I love Aryan and I love Aryan with um, the other two actors, their chemistry, the three of them together is so great. And there's hardly going to be any of that in the third um, episode, uh, season because Annabeth is kidnapped for, mo for the majority of that season. I wonder if they're going to write him in a little bit more in the third. Yeah. So I hope that they find some way to bring him in. They have some more scenes with him, at least alone or something, or they have just more time, more episodes or whatever, where they reunite with him in his wedding dress. Oh my god, um, yes. <laughs> before they like actually get to like the end. Like just make that part of the story last a little bit longer or have them rescue him before they get to like Cersei's Island or something, something, something. I don't know. Whatever they come up with, that would and I'm sure they will want to because 
they also love Aryan <laughs> and want him to be in as many scenes as they can. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, I was going to say this, and I forgot to. When we were talking about Percy and Grover's friendship and how sweet it is, mm -hmm. that the the acting coach that they all talk about how much they love, um, he did an interview with a podcast that I haven't listened to because I'm quite sure it's going to make me cry because the one thing that this acting coach does really well is he um he like very well explains the like complicated like complex emotions that all of their characters are feeling like i remember there's like a small clip in the behind the scenes documentary where they're watch they're they're just filming him talking to them before a scene and he's explaining like what does Kleos mean and they say like glory like that's the way that he explains what Kleos and glory and stuff mean of like being known and like doing something because in that way it's a way to like get like a bunch of teenage kids to understand what that really even means and um anyway in this the one clip from that interview I saw that I was like yeah you're definitely gonna make me cry whenever I get like when I just and when I'm sad and crying already and I decide this is the time to watch this when I'm already sad um he's very sweet like as a person I would love to talk to him because he very much like kind of mirrors what we say about this stuff but he was saying that they were asking about it was like a Percy and Annabeth like specific question and I thought it was funny because in like the his like his camera, you can tell by the look on his face that he looks like annoyed that they're asking about only them. <laughs> and I was like, I agree with you, sir. Thank you for looking kind of annoyed by that. And he's like, he's like, I consider Grover as part of this as well. And he was saying that um, he's like, they, they like recognize the like orphanness in each other. Mm -hmm. And like the way he described it was like, was like Percy recognizes the fact that Annabeth doesn't have a good mom in her life and it just makes him think about how he does about how he misses his mom because she is a good mom and how like Annabeth would see that Percy doesn't have like a found family kind of thing he's not around people who understand him and she does and so she knows what that's like to like miss that because she she has that and like the say and he's basically saying like the way he described it was like it's like kids that just find each other at like a playground and mm -hmm. then as they're talking you realize that like all of their parent all of your parents are divorced or something like that you all have something in common and you're yeah. like oh that's weird i didn't know that about you that that's literally every every single friend <laughs> that i've made that has become like a legitimate friend in my life I get to know them and then they start telling me their like traumatic tragic family backstory <laughs> like i that it was just such a sweet way to describe that because i'm like yeah that's exactly and he like starts crying when in this clip when he's talking about it and i'm like yeah that's exactly what that like dynamic is like i i'm remembering how when i was in like high school one of my closest friends in high school um, we became friends for like months or, or like a year or something before we ever like hung out like at each other's houses. No one ever came to my house. They like, I went to her house, but um, I remember that I, we were friends for like a year or so. And then she told me that her mom was uh, essayed by her dad. Mm -hmm. And it, that it was like this whole weird thing where her mom would, her mom was like the worst where she would just like openly talk about it with her like oh my gosh explicit sort of stuff and and like basically do that horrible thing of like you can't be that upset about your childhood because mine was actually really bad oh. and that i want to slap the shit out of like every incest survivor who does that to people i get so angry because it's like no you don't you don't get to like have super traumatic experiences and then use them as a weapon you're not able to I'm sorry, you can't claim those as trauma anymore if you're using it to make other people feel bad so that they don't get mad at you. And like, it was just, I remember at that time looking, I look back at that now and I'm just like, that is fucking hilarious. That one of my closest friends, their mom went through what I was going through ex at that time, but I didn't say that. And, and they didn't know that about me. 
and that friend went through something not that but something in that general area um mm -hmm. as well and and all that kind of stuff and it's just one of those strange things that like i didn't know about any of that stuff until we were friends for like over a year or two years or something yeah and, and it, we just like we became friends because we would talk about like theater stuff and like yeah. and like you know tv and movies and things like that that we watched we did like stage crew together that's like how we became friends we would, we didn't know anything about any of that stuff and that's literally every single person that i've ever become friends with at this point i just like wait for, <laughs> wait for it to happen i'm like yeah you're gonna tell me something i know you are you're gonna also, tell me something neurodivergent thing like i feel like part of it might be that because like was it you who's, I don't remember if you sent me this video or if you stitched it, but it was the one of someone talking about being the secret friend. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I had that experience with a few of my friends. Like mm -hmm. there definitely was friends who I wasn't a secret with and those are the ones that either had trauma or were neurodivergent. And um, the, the ones that kept me a secret, they at least had some like skin in the game. Like one of my best friends, she did have trauma, but she was popular. So she didn't hang out with me at school, but we hung out all the time after school. Yeah, that's how most of my friends were for a lot of life was friends, friends like that, like a friend, I don't know, it's hard to even call those people friends. Um, yeah. Like my mom and I were talking about this recently and she's like, those people did care about you. And I'm like, yeah, but like, what does that really matter if they cared but not enough to like actually be helpful in any real way um yeah. like one of the childhood friends i had like she would tell me that she would never invite me to her birthday parties we didn't go i that was she was somebody i was friends with at my very first school that i moved away from in second grade and it was i look back at that now that a lot of the kids they're girls that like bullied me really badly um like my mom was telling i brought this up with my mom recently because she would remember more things than me and she and it made me remember that there was a time that i went to like a kid's back, this was back when for some reason we would all have birthday parties at mcdonald's oh, <laughs> and no, mcdonald's was party. like the place where you wanted to have birthday parties at it was like the popular place i don't know what why we did that in the in the 90s it was I don't know what made that stop either <laughs> at some point it did anyway i went to one of those and um the girls that did didn't that hated me um that two of them like later apologized to me later on in life and i was just like go away um pretty much they one of them like stole my shoes because they liked the shoes that i had on and so i was forced to wear their shoes home that didn't fit me and my mom like, I, and I remember getting home and that my feet hurt a lot and that they were like, you know, bruised and stuff um, when I got home and that my mom noticed, of course, right away and called and called those kids moms and was like, was like, your daughter stole my daughter's shoes. These are obviously not hers because they don't even fit her feet. You need to bring them back to me right now. And yeah. like the mom like apologized for her kid and did it. But those girls were like friends with that friend. And after I moved away, she would tell me like, oh, I'm not inviting you because you don't know any of my friends. But I think that she just, I was the secret friend that no one else from her school probably knew that we were even still friends anymore. Yeah. Um, because none of them liked me, obviously. They like were horrible to me. <laughs> like, and from like kindergarten on, they just didn't like me. And, ugh. and like, there were people like that all the way through school that, it, it's part of why I have like a complex with friends now that I have a hard time believing that that's not still happening yeah. um, or that somebody is going to suddenly just like change their mind about me and just like leave because that happens so much that I that it's just I just got used to it <laughs> of like, yeah, this is probably going to happen. So I'm going to enjoy what I have with this like friend while I can and just hope that it doesn't stop at some point. Um, yeah. It's just a horrible dynamic when that kind of stuff happens. It is a very neurodivergent thing to happen. Um, yeah. And it it's like weirdly, ref I don't know. It's like weirdly reflected sometimes in like the actors who play these kids on screen. 
Mm -hmm. Like Walker literally said that he did not have friends until he started doing acting and that the Percy Jackson cast was his first like actual friend group. And this child did not say that they, that he thought that they were actually friends until like three months ago. (laughs) I I was like, honey, like you guys filmed an entire season for 10 months together and, and then did a bunch of press for another six months after that. And it wasn't until like two months ago that you actually felt sure that these people were your friends. Like that says enough on its own about what kind of experience he had at school. Dear God. That's the like, Saturn placement shit. Cause he's like, I'm at work. They're coworkers. They're being nice to me because they're coworkers. Yeah. Like they have, or like they're nice to me, but like maybe they don't really like me or maybe they're being nice to me because they have to be around me, but they don't actually like me that much. Like that's the kind of stuff that I would, that I say to myself still to this day, but especially back then it would be like, yeah, maybe they're just being nice to me because they have to, because especially with somebody, a child like him, like he's, Percy Jackson, (laughs) like he's in almost every scene of the show. There's only a couple of scenes in the whole season one that he's not in. And so it's like, are you really not going to get along with the kid that is around like at work with you every single day for like 10 hours, every single day for 10 months? Like that makes it hard to believe that they actually do like you. If if you at least have a history of people not liking you in the past, because you feel like they're just being, they have to like me because they have to be around me. Um, mm-hmm. That's a hard thing to like completely let go of. But I, I do think that it's weirdly reflected like with him at least in the cast. And then also shows up in Percy, like he identifies with Percy a lot because that's also Percy. <laughs> like yeah. Grover is his only long-term friend. And even the beginning of this book, he's like almost questioning like, um Annabeth is still my friend right (laughs) like let me look at her picture like I thought that one of the things that was like funny but also is like do you want to die (laughs) was when the like the the villain um bully kid took Annabeth's picture Mm -hmm. and started like ripping the sides of it and stuff and he was just like give that back to me right now and he was just like who's this girl and then when she shows up in gym in like the gym class and stuff, he's like, oh, it's the girl from the photo. <laughs> that whole thing of how the rich kid is just watching all of this, whatever he sees, who knows what he actually saw. But it just, it like summed up my, like, I think every unpopular kids, especially neurodivergent kids experience in middle school that the rich asshole is the one that starts everything. Mm-hmm. He instigates the whole thing. The Canadians, our friends are like hanging around him because he's a horrible person. So monsters literally like, yeah, you're cool. And mm-hmm. they, they're they the ones that start the entire thing. He's like sitting there laughing about like Percy and stuff and, and Tyson getting hurt. Everything like literally blows up and goes horrible. And then when the teacher wakes up from it, he immediately is like, oh, it was Percy's fault. And yeah. the teacher just believes him. And it's like, of course that's what happened. Of course course you believe the kid that is known for starting fights over the kid that spends his entire year trying to get people to be nice to a homeless kid. I'm so curious how they're going to play that. That scene is going to be done well. If Mm -hmm. if they're going to do any scene well to start off that first episode, it's probably going to be that one. And I can't wait to see how they interpret the mist that the teacher is going through because the book... Percy is making assumptions. He's saying, I'm pretty sure he was getting feedback in his hearing aid. So he's reading a magazine. He can't hear that literally. These kids are dropping. I mean, the the chapter calls them cannonballs. Like, yeah, and they're fiery. Like, that's part of why he was so scared Tyson was hurt. Mm -hmm. So, like, what what are we going to see that, like, I want to see the back and forth of, like, the teacher's vision and this is what's actually happening. Yeah, I remember I liked I liked how in like the fourth episode when they're on the train that and like the chimera that has like three heads yeah. and has like a stinger thing is attacking them. But when like that random family sees it, they see like a tiny little like poodle. <laughs> and so they're like, well, how is a poodle making all of this like ruckus? 
Lola. Yeah. And so I'm like, I, I liked how they like show the difference. And so that will be a scene that will be really interesting for them to do that because they kind of have to, because how else, like, there's no other way to describe like how a, a, a regular person could be sitting in this room where there are multiple monsters throwing cannonballs at their head and trying to kill and literally yelling about how they want to kill him and like and all this kind of stuff without them noticing so it'll be really interesting to see what they come up with to show like what does the teacher see or even like the bully kid like what does the bully kid see like what does he think is happening right now does he have any idea at all of what is actually going on like he can't actually know what's really happening is he like confused about how much destruction seems to be happening from like regular dodgeballs um it would just be interesting to show that because i think that this scene is one of the ones in the books that shows the most of how it's like impossible for percy to just like exist i think that is like so frustrating about that whole scene beyond what how it happens is that it's the last day of school and that school and he gets um expelled on his last freaking day he makes it through the entire year before that all happens on his very last day and there's no way that he could ever explain what happened there's no way that anyone would ever believe that he didn't do something to somehow cause that to happen even though it makes no sense that a seventh grade kid would have like weapons that could do all of that stuff like they like destroy like the door to like the locker room like it like the like the gym is on fire and so it's just like this horrible helpless moment that he spends that entire year trying so hard not to have fights with anyone dealing Mm -hmm. with somebody being horrible to him every single day at school and being horrible to tyson but like tries to do what he can to like stay under the radar in the way that a lot of kids like us do where we don't tell like teachers and stuff what's really going on because we because we don't want to get in trouble like is like just trying to get through a school year because he knows why he can't get through one and there's only so much he can do so he just has to put up with this shit and just hope that he can get through only for it to be ruined on the last stupid day yeah and like the fact that he just walks out of the gym with annabeth yeah. Like, not even trying to explain himself or deal with any teachers. He's done it so many times that he's just like, yeah, no, we're not doing this. Bye. Yeah. And it's just like that horrible, helpless feeling of like, you know, that no one is no one's ever going to believe me that I wasn't the one who did this. Anyone at the school would look at my record and they would assume that it was me. And they're just never going to believe that I'm not the one behind all of this. They're definitely not going to believe like the, that the rich kid did it over me. Um, and you just are like, I give up. <laughs> and, and like all of the like magical things in this world can be, there are like real world, like things that mirror that. And that's just such a, that's such a normal experience, especially when you have abusive people at home is that like, you can't do stuff like that. You can't say things like that to because they'll they're gonna find out about it um even like bad stuff that is happening to you you don't want to tell them about it because their reaction to it will be like insane compared to how most people would react and so you just don't say anything well i guess we, we have to go to camp anyway so i might as well just leave because there's no way the school isn't going to evict me so i just like give up trying well and I think the one thing that, like, makes me feel a little bit better about how this one went down than, like, the first one is that he doesn't have everyone around him gaslighting anymore. Because before, like, in the beginning, the thing with Miss Stodds and the Lightning Thief, you kind of are wondering, oh, is this, like, a childhood fantasy hallucination thing? But in this one, you're like, no, it's real, but because of circumstances, literally no one is going to believe him so he just has to walk away from the situation yeah like at least in this situation like annabeth is there and Mm -hmm. he knows that this really happened and that it wasn't really his fault like his mom his mom would never not believe him anyway but he knows especially now that she definitely will believe him and that any of the other kids at camp would understand this whole situation that he's not by himself this time that Annabeth and Tyson are both on his side in that way, even if nobody else is. 
yeah. like I'm just imagining like Sally at home that day she never get, she never sees Percy like again for a little while after that like they go on their quest right after this and so then she doesn't get to tell him what's going on at camp and instead gets a phone call from his school principal being like your son blew up the gym yeah how did he blow up the gym we're not sure why do you think that it's him then <laughs> like i just can't i just like imagine how many conversations like that she had with like that story i was telling about my mom i just imagine sally doing similar things of just showing up at school being like fuck you guys <laughs> yeah. and like fuck everything about this stupid school that you immediately just are sure that my son is the one who did it um just because he's not here and didn't try to stand up for himself basically like, what is but it's like if this happens would you want to stay and like and want to stay at the school any longer if something like that happened to you when you were here like no you would leave yeah. what are you talking about yeah and we have like a mortal bully who's so horrible that the Lystragonians attached to him immediately and like yeah. without question because Percy's just like these random kids are a part of his group there's usually only two but like randomly they're here and they all seem to be normal and the, like this is normal for them mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah it's it's so interesting like because Rick's kind of doing two things with that in my opinion he's showing that the bully is really that bad and he's showing that like that it, it can be so believable how some of these things are happening because they're like oh yeah this is par for the course for bully behavior yeah and like it's one of those it's just that frustrating thing of the one like part of percy jackson fan fiction i think is fun to read is when people mash up percy with um the avengers mm -hmm. because the event even the avengers stuff is like small for people in percy jackson where and but it's a really funny dynamic all the time because a lot of those stories start with the avengers trying to kidnap him or or like arrest him because they think that he's a terrorist because of all the schools that he got kicked out of and that he gets kicked out of most of them because of bombs in like the percy jackson world you know the whole thing with like the arch happens when he's 12. he yeah. like the version that they see in like the book at least version of the Ares fight is that people think that he's like on a beach fighting like his kidnapper with like a giant knife or whatever and when he's like a 12 year old kid and it's like this whole international like you know story like you would imagine that would be and so it makes sense why they would think that about him but literally most of those stories start with them trying to arrest him because they think that he might be like a terrorist of some kind and they can never arrest him because he's Percy Jackson and he has powers and it's really funny how there's one story in particular <laughs> that always makes me laugh because all like all of the Avengers eventually start trying to show up to arrest him because they all keep losing when they fight him and Annabeth and they don't understand why because it's like this is just two 18 year old kids why are you guys so bad at this and so they all start showing up and Annabeth and you know and Percy or Annabeth and Percy and so they're just they immediately can see where they are where they're hiding and they're like just come out already and they just like fight all of them and beat them and just walk away and they just keep telling them to leave them alone but that's like that's the whole thing with him is like it's so easy to look at kind of his life and his story and think that he's a bad kid when he's not at all and there's no way for him to really explain that to people yeah how do you it's just that whole impossible thing of if people think that you're a bad kid and there's anything at all where they could think that about you there's nothing that you can do really to convince them that you're not like no matter how much you try it like you just can't do anything you're just stuck with that and especially with stuff like that with schools and shit it's just like if the school thinks that you're a troublesome kid you're just done for like it remind it reminds me of kids that i knew when i was in middle school and high school like i said before but that stuff always makes me mad because i remember those kids when because i was always nice to those kids because we were a lot of the times in the same sort of position of nobody liked us but we had to go to school every day and our parents also sucked yeah. and so we were just kind of like i remember my eighth grade social studies teacher was horrible and there's this one kid in my class i don't know what learning disability he had because I don't remember 
but I just remembered that he would sometimes go to like the LG classroom. I would see him in there sometimes when I would be in there doing like my math tutoring and stuff. And it, that teacher though, he would be sitting in class, not doing anything, completely quiet. And she would just like call him out and kick him out of class. And it was bad to the point that the rest of us in class were like, what did he do wrong? Yeah, he's just sitting there. He's not doing anything. And it was just because he was like labeled as like a bad kid or whatever, or because he had some sort of learning disability or what have you that she just would find any reason to kick him out of class and make him get up and leave. And that whole thing was so, is so like embarrassing yeah. when that happens, when you have to go to that, then you have to go to the LD classroom and try to explain why they made you leave class. And and it's like, there is no reason for why. And it's just, it's so hard to try to get through school already. And then on top of it, when you, like this is ignoring the fact that Percy also has ADHD and dyslexia. And yeah. so like, even like, I thought one of the things that was funny when he was at school was that when the Canadians were around and they said like their name or, or he saw something with their name on it, he like, wasn't sure if it actually said that or if it was his dyslexia making him see something different than was actually there and it's like there's a million reasons for why school is so hard for him yeah i it, it's so funny because i know this wasn't my first time reading sea of monsters but like rereading it and forgetting that that's what happened I totally was like, no, you're not, you don't have dyslexia. That sounds like monster names. Like on him missing that, that little detail. I love that Tyson picks it out first. Tyson's just like, those kids smell like yeah. something's wrong. They smell. Yeah. I love that too. I, I love how the thing I always like about Percy Jackson stuff is that Percy, like we say a million times, feels like he needs to protect everyone and is always willing to sacrifice himself for everybody else. But that doesn't mean that his friends are, <laughs> won't like, will just like let him do that. And so I like how Tyson is like trying to protect Percy in his way of being like, there's something wrong with those kids. They smell bad. There's something off with them in like a different way. Even if he can't verbally say like they're monsters in that way he just knows that something's bad and even like when the whole reason why annabeth like reveals herself is because one of them attacks percy and yes. she punches one of them like right in the face and it's like stay away from my friend mm -hmm. and it's just like get away from him right now <laughs> and yeah. it's just i always like those parts that they add that in because it's like yeah it's really easy to make your hero self-sacrificing but if you have them be real people their friends are not going to just let them do that yeah they'll be like no no <laughs> you're not i know what you're thinking stop <laughs> yeah like we're gonna we're gonna also protect you you don't have to do all this stuff mm -hmm. um that's it's why they're friends otherwise i get so annoyed in stories like even fantasy whatever ones like this where they they don't have that stuff happen because it's like you guys are shitty friends <laughs> you don't like that's that's my whole gigantic chip on my shoulder about ron and harry potter is that multiple times in those stories he he gets mad at harry for the things that he has to do and it's like are you mentally damaged that your friend is like forced to join this tournament and has to fight a dragon and you're like mad at him because you're jealous like do you want to fight a dragon <laughs> right and if all of the people to know how like dangerous dragons are his brother works at them like yeah hello. and also like to know your friend that harry by that book you know for sure harry doesn't want attention yeah, no yeah. like kid in that sort of situation wants attention we just want to be left alone Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to be the, like the main character. <laughs> we want to be left alone where we can just be one of the side, like literally it is so fun. I was talking to a friend of mine last night and I was, we were talking about how we identify, we like process things in our life through like the fiction stuff that we've watched. And we both have done that since we were kids. And, and I was saying like, yeah, uh, like Percy and like Luke Skywalker and all these like main character people, I always love them because they remind me of me and they act so much like me and I can like try to process 
the disaster of my life through like their the way that they handle it or like figure out almost like what I even want out of life by like the things they have that I wish that I could have things like that and she's like yeah you do have like main character energy and I'm like I know this sounds like I'm a, being a main character but I don't think that I do <laughs> and that's like what all those main characters think like Percy constantly is like why does anybody care about me <laughs> like why am I like why am I the one like I'm just gonna I'm gonna be the prophecy kid because I want to I, I, I'm not going to make a 10 year old child do it, but also, and I, I, I'll just do it because it's the right thing to do, but it's, but he also genuinely doesn't understand why anybody cares about him. And it's in, in that way, like he doesn't see himself in that same way. Harry Potter doesn't either. He's just kind of like, I'm just here. What the fuck? <laughs> and, but it's that whole dynamic of like, I don't want to be the center of attention. I would actually be really happy to be like a side character that nobody actually looks at. But somehow that's never what I get to do in my life. <laughs> it's just the Leo experience. You know, <laughs> people think we're trying to get the center of attention, that we're trying to put all this drama on us. It comes our way sometimes. It's like, I really cannot help this one. Sorry. Like a, a whole thing with characters like that is we don't want that, but our like life experiences kind of force us to be in that position because it's like, who the fuck else has this experience? Yeah. Like who, who else? like with Harry Potter even like who else is told from the age of 11 that he's gonna be everyone's like Jesus savior because he didn't die when he was a baby and everyone knows about his parents more and his family than he actually does he doesn't know anything about anything and the same kind of thing with Percy where like even in this these chapters like people everyone else seems to have figured out that Tyson is a cyclops and he has no freaking clue what's going on and I don't think at that point he's even met one before. So I'm not even sure if he realized that Tyson was like a monster of some kind, if he even would understand what he actually was. Mm -hmm. um, because he's still like new to everything and is just trying to figure it all out. And everyone else knows everything, including his mother, not <laughs> telling him what's going on at camp. Well, and I, I love that like Percy's whole thing is like, yes, this kid seems to be challenged, but I, I am too. Like, mm -hmm. and finding that camaraderie even though their their functional needs and their support needs are very different call it like chronic illnesses or just like chronic problems mm -hmm. disability stuff it's kind of a necessary thing to find at least one person in your life that has something mm -hmm. similar to that because otherwise it's just like no one i genuinely like spend sometimes i spend time sitting there be, thinking of like could I ever be friends with a normal person? <laughs> like someone who isn't neurodivergent in any way, shape or form had like a happy childhood. I don't even know how to talk to somebody like that. I, I feel like we wouldn't talk. I would just sit there and stare at them <laughs> because I wouldn't even know what to say to people like that. Like, I feel like even more of an alien around people like that because it's like, I don't, everything that I would say about literally anything that's ever happened to me at any aspect of my life for the entirety of my life would depress you. And so I feel like I should just not say anything. So I'm just not going to. <laughs> yeah, with, with me, I like, I thought I had my one person that was like, no trauma, which is Jake, but his trauma just wasn't parent trauma. <laughs> like the the whole cab part the gray sisters is that something that's in greek mythology or did he make that up it is um they're not the fates they're different than the fates if i'm remembering mm -hmm. i don't remember exactly but like there's kind of a reoccurring motif of sisters of three <laughs> i feel like for some reason three is the number and i remember i can't remember there's some other like fantasy ish thing that i've read before where because the thing where they're like sharing one eye That's, and they're like yeah. fighting so, over who oh, that reminds me of something else but i don't know what it is so in hercules they have the fates do it the fates yes. all share one eyeball mm -hmm. and something else they share an eyeball some other physical feature um but that's actually the Gray Sisters, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, like, one other thought that I have about Tyson is as much as we have a, as a society have moved away 
from the R slur being used so casually. I kind of hope that they still include Percy getting mad at Sloan for saying it. About I did too, because there are kids out there that probably that still use it. Um, this really weird thing happened on TikTok. Um, like teenage-ish kids were trying to say that we're wanting to say it again and be like, as like an idea of like, oh, we're like reclaiming this word. And it's like, no, like, no, um, no, like, please, no. Like, ugh. I just remember so many people calling me that, um, including my sister. She did it a lot. Um, and so I really don't like that word at all. And it just reminds me of all that kind of stuff. My sister still uses that word. Oh, yeah, people who she still like, use it unironically. Was, she like said it uh, when I saw her like over this past week. And when she said it, I just kind of looked at her like, are you seriously saying this word still? Like it like I didn't. Um, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like the kid that was like a 35 year old adult in my own head. But even back when I was in middle school and stuff, when people would say that word, I hated it and mm -hmm. I would tell people not to or I would try to like make fun of her whenever she would say it or whatever or try to explain why she should stop um but she still did anyway and so I'm sure that there are still kids that say those sort of things especially especially on a show like this where quite literally not exaggerating every single character is disabled that it feels like I, I hope that Disney lets them say it especially because the way that it's phrased it's like a but it's so obvious of how bad you are as a person if you use that word and if you're going to bring slurs like that up that's the way to frame them of showing kids like never say this under any circumstance it hurts people, it's harmful, it's a horrible thing to think about a person to call somebody something like that. And like, when you're a kid and you're watching a show like this, you don't want to be the one to make Percy upset. And so it makes them, it, it's an easy way for them to show that kids shouldn't say, say slurs, not even just that slur then, but like any of them. And we'll just, it's an easy way to kind of put something in to make kids watching this to like rethink when, because it's very easy, I remember, I remember a lot of the kids that said stuff like that to me and stuff like that in middle school, they would just kind of say it because of like peer pressure mm -hmm. that all that like the po other popular kids would say those words to the really unpopular kids. And so they would just kind of join in so that the, you know, the kids that were doing that stuff would leave them alone. And so it's easy, I think, when you're not autistic and don't understand hierarchies and reject all forms of peer pressure because yeah. that's something that we do um if you're not like that and even if you are like that but you like just really want to fit in so you just like give into like those beliefs even if you don't necessarily agree with them it's it's just really easy to do that but a show like this could do something with that at least bring it up that like it's a really bad word to use to talk about other kids like that and especially yeah. Um, like a couple months ago, <laughs> a couple months ago, I remember there was this asshole on Twitter that happens every once in a while that, and, and they get like re, they get like ratioed to death where the responses and the retweets are way more than like the people who like what they said, which is basically what being um, ratioed means for anyone who doesn't know, know what that means. <laughs> Um, I had explained this to my mother recently, so this is why I'm doing this of like what being ratioed means. Um, I don't even know why my mom was asking me about that. <laughs> but anyway, um, he did this tweet that was trying to be like, trying to say like, oh, disability shouldn't be in like science fiction or fantasy. Um, because if you're in a, fit, in, in a fantasy world, shouldn't all disabilities go away? And it's like that horrible like eugenicist sort of idea of like in a fantasy world all everyone's problems would be solved and so there wouldn't be any sort of disabilities and so as part of like counteracting that very stupid statement people just started posting like retweeting that tweet and posting people that are like the heroes in science fiction fantasy things that are all disabled like luke skywalker is disabled he doesn't have one of his hands and it, that's a, actually a regular thing in Star Wars. <laughs> like Anakin's disabled, Luke is disabled. Um, 
there's some of the kids and like the new ones are too i can't remember like if ray or finn are one of them is but i can't remember right now but but a lot of the posts during that were included percy because it was like hi percy has adhd and dyslexia literally every single person that is a hero on the literally every single one is Ever. disabled are you going to say that the kid who is a child of a god doesn't get to be a hero because he has disabilities because that's stupid yeah <laughs> but yeah in a show like this that was created by somebody who is advocating for the disabled kids i can't imagine that they would that they would shy away from making a point out of that yeah i mean like sometimes that comes off really cheesy so i'm thinking of a seventh heaven episode where um, <laughs> yeah yes, seventh like, heaven. um so there was a seventh heaven episode where there's like the black version of the camdens <laughs> and, um they're like all hosting them because their church got lit on fire or something of course and, and so while they're out on the playground, someone says the N word to the the Simon equivalent and <laughs> Simon gets in a fight with him. And yes. so it becomes a, oh, well, you were wrong for hitting him. I understand why you did it, but you shouldn't have hit him. It, it, it came off so cheesy or like, I don't remember if Disney Channel sponsored the commercial, but the one that people famously use is that um, Hillary Duff commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, that's so girl who wears a skirt like a shirt yeah. <laughs> i just had like so many flashbacks to seven seven i love tyson so much he's so adorable but he's just, just like a like a sweet little like break for percy that um he always loves him no matter what he always has something very nice to say he and just is never puts like anything on him and just always loves him unconditionally in that way and doesn't and is like part of the stuff that's going on like he's part of the big battles and stuff but he doesn't ever make percy feel anything um he's one of the rare people that never guilt trips him over luke yeah in any of the books he just loves percy and is so excited about being his brother and yeah. and it is just like I gave you a, let me build you a watch. I built you a watch that also has a shield in it so you don't die. I do hope they also, um, that they choose somebody who has a disability for Tyson. Me too. Yeah. I, I just love, I love that. Um, I love the idea, especially because of, it's just this show, like Rick Riordan making it, it being what it is. It's just very, it's a very, it's rare, I find, that a show in this way can very easily introduce an actor who has a disability playing a character that you could see as some sort of disabled mm -hmm. usually it's harder at least from what other people say it's harder to introduce characters like that like people love toff so mm -hmm. much in avatar the last airbender because she is a disabled character that will absolutely stomp your face off like not her disability is never seen as a bad thing it's part of what makes her so powerful and yeah. it's honestly a rare thing to see something like that but on this show like literally everybody is and so if if hollywood was actually going to cast a disabled person to play a disabled person it would be this show yeah. because everyone is disabled so it's it's very it's normal um for them to do that and it, it would be very simple. It wouldn't like cause like an uproar or whatever. Like there's like no risk to that mm -hmm. on on a show like this where everybody has multiple disabilities. Um, yeah. No matter how smart they are, they all have ADHD and dyslexia. So it's like, it's in, in the way that Hollywood usually uses for not having disabled actors play those roles. It doesn't actually, it doesn't apply um on this show it just doesn't make sense yeah well and i mean we've already seen them wreck it once they're not gonna go that bad again <laughs> like mm -hmm. i i ha still haven't watched the full thing of sea of monsters logan lerman movie but the oh fact God. like after you said it i had to see and <laughs> part of me wants to like so the newest olympian is uh one of the percy jackson podcasts the guy who does that show is fun because 
he didn't read the books until he was in his 30s and so he's reading all the books for the first time talking mm -hmm. about things i want to go back and listen to him because he says that he is like the an most anti-luke podcast and the thing that has stopped me from listening to any other like popular percy podcast that i've run into that has like interviewed people who are involved in the show is because they say things about that are like defending luke and i'm like no goodbye i don't want to hear any of that i literally it it honestly like makes me anxious hearing people try to make excuses for somebody like luke because it just scares me about the kind of stuff that people let slide in like actual life if they are making excuses for this sort of character um but he doesn't which makes me want to listen to it but anyway he has a bunch of episodes where he watches sea of monsters and he, and just like talks about how insane it is and like rips it apart and there's even a couple episodes in there where they read through like the original script for the lightning thief that is even worse than the lightning thief movie like i remember the thing like in the description for those episodes i saw on spotify he was saying that um that like the original script for the lightning thief grover is like super fucking horny for some reason Mm -hmm. He keeps talking about, like, literally saying, I'm so horny right now. <laughs> I was like, why? Why? Oh, my God. But yeah. um, I remember one of those, like, TikTok videos I saw when the show first came out and people were, like, making fun of the movie versus, versus the show. One of those I saw somebody, it was, like, one of those, like, ones where they just had, like, the words on the screen. And they were saying, like, sometimes I sit back and remember that in the Sea of Monsters movie, Kronos eats Luke. And I was like, what? He eats yeah. him? He I need eats to him? <laughs> and she was just like, I swear. I Like, I believe you because those movies are so bad. But, like, what? <laughs> like, why would they do that? That's hilarious. It's like, well, Kronos eats his kids in the mythology, so... Like, of course, yeah, Kronos eats him. <laughs> That's like a bad example, because we've talked about how in the show they changed, they changed Hephaestus's um, amusement park, mm -hmm. and they changed it by incorporating a different myth. Mm -hmm. And that was perfect. That was done so well. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like they tried to do that and just failed at it. <laughs> I feel like that, that one TikTok that somebody made where they're comparing what they did in like the show versus the book versus the show versus the movie for when they were at Medusa's it was like the book version was that they use like um like their intelligence and they use like it was like iPods back mm -hmm. then they use like the reflection from the iPods to see her and cut her head off without having to actually look her in the eye um the show version is you know that um, they put like Annabeth's hat on her and so Percy just cuts her head off where he's not able to see her and they use her head to kill the other fury thing without having to look her in the eye but it's the same general idea of like using their intelligence and their strategy to figure it out and then the the movie version is Annabeth isn't even there for some reason she's outside in a car driving with her eyes closed <laughs> and Percy literally just like walks up and like finds like a cell phone and just uses the cell phone camera and just does it with nobody else's around. He just does it on his own and doesn't even know what he's doing. And and like then they have to go find like Grover and Annabeth for some reason drives a car into the wall um, yeah. when they're trying to get out. And it's just like that those sort of differences of like you can change certain things. That's fine. Like the show changes things and it's fine if the general idea behind these things are still there. And so, like, it doesn't matter that they changed the stuff in the Medusa scene because the general idea of showing that Percy and Annabeth and Grover are intelligent and they're coming up with multiple plans and, like, working through not getting along together. Yeah. But figuring out those plans, that is the point of that scene. Having Percy just, like, walk up and find a random cell phone and, and kill Medusa before he even realizes what he's doing. Does he turn into a hamster? Does he turn into, like a giant bear instead of a hamster or something or does somebody else turn into a, a random animal and does he like kill um polythemus when he's like a rabid bear instead of a real person or or, or does like 
Polyphemus get like dr- just like Rover kill him and cut his head off? I don't even know. Yeah. Like, who knows what actually happens? Like people who watch the movie know, but I'm like honestly weirdly like curious and also scared to find out. Yeah, I I kind of want to finish it now. Yeah. I just have to like Logan Lerman being stuck with like those movies. Um I I think that now that the show it has happened and people have kind of been able to move on that they'll leave it because it was it was a whole weird thing before the show came out that even in the run-up to the show coming out that a lot of interviewers would ask walker if he like heard anything from logan and he would have to say he didn't Mm -hmm. um that like logan sent him like a like a dm or something at some point but um and basically yeah, said, like, the torch. like said basically like tell him to to get used to eating like blue food all the time but he ba- he was not being like mean but he literally just said like i feel like i don't need to say anything to him because he's a good actor but it was just kind of one of those weird things of like people wanted them to like talk about what it's like to play this role but like logan was like i don't know what it's like to play this role because i wasn't really percy jackson <laughs> and so he has like nothing to say um, so that was always awkward when they would ask him about that because he would have to say that he had, like never had a real conversation with him about it at all. Um, and also it would be an absolutely absurd com- like Walker who had read the book six times by the time that he was 13 years old needs yeah. anyone alive to tell him what it's like to be Percy Jackson. No, I don't think so. I think he's good. I yeah. think he's more than good. Like this child like reads the book scenes before he does scenes of the show to like yeah. remind himself of what Percy is thinking about. So he thinks about those things when he films the scene. Like he doesn't need somebody to tell him what it's like to be Percy. I think oh, everything really? is fine. <laughs> like, but it's just like that whole idea of people were awkward about it. They like wanted Logan to play like Poseidon or something or be somebody in the show. And I'd like, no, just like, let it be, <sighs> just let it be what it is and not like try to bring him into it like at least logan has um perks of being a wallflower we talked through chapter three so we can talk talk another couple chapters next week Mm -hmm. and i'm kind of hoping there will be news (laughs) i'm hoping there will be more news maybe a casting release that would be great because if they're starting to film in on august 1st there's usually a month or so of the cast um like training and stuff for like sword fighting or for this one it would probably be a bunch of people doing like underwater training again Uh, like walker's obviously done some leah did a little bit but like anyone who would be like in the water at all or near it would have to go through that and a lot more of them are going to be in this in this season so they'll likely be in canada by like the beginning of july And so it would make sense for the show to start announcing those things because the new cast members will have to do like totally new training. Like none of them have learned how to sword fight or fight or any of that stuff at all. Yeah. So hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to know who baby Tyson is going to be. I just want to know who Tyson's going to be. Yeah. If they release that one by next, oh, that would be perfect. But it'd be also nice to see who's going to be some of the gods that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Or Thalia. Oh, man. Yeah. That one, I'm sure they're going to save to the very end because it's literally the ending unless they decide to do flashback scenes. Yeah. All right. So we will talk a little bit more sea monsters and whatever news comes out next time.